Welcome to the Sports Card Talk Show. To the Sports Card Talk Show. Sports Card Talk Show with Kevin Anderson and Lauren Walker, the Skull Brothers. Welcome to episode 53 of the Sports Card Talk Show. Um, today we have Monday Mount Rushmore, but it's actually hijacking Friday Night Lights, huh? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah. What do we got going today? Uh, today we're doing the Miami Dolphins and Daisy with at twin z trouble is helping us out with that so. awesome awesome well we'll get them on the line in a second here i actually got a couple packages if we don't mind opening quick yep yeah i'm all right jack to see what you got all right i pre-cut got our cutter up there from mt sports cards um so yeah this one was packaged really well oh nice double packaged finally i get a nice package there you go all right so it's a james worthy on card Seven of ten, opulence basketball. Let me see that. That's nice. Sweet looking card, dude. Our, our good buddy Drew at uh, Big Grizzly Cards just made a little post about uh, getting short print um, cards of his favorite, you know, vets or whatever. Almost like those a little bit more than some random patch or autograph of somebody you never heard and. I was like, oh, that's so funny. I just bought this card. And I'm like, yeah, I got to point that out, that that's kind of what I'm I'm more interested in. Short print and on-card auto. Actually, I like that one. It's so cool. Yeah, like James Worthy, my memory of him is always running the wing and taking <laughs> yeah. up and just dunking the ball. Yeah, like, yeah. big game take, James. <laughs> yeah, take, taking some no-look pass from Magic and uh, putting it down. So most of these are just, uh, if you spend $20 with this with this seller you got five dollars off so oh okay so about you... bought a little package of uh all clear for takeoff from optic basketball i really just wanted the julius irving but there's a mcgrady larry nance jr blake griffin and another tracy mcgrady so those are kind of fun but the card i really wanted was a uh, michael cooper on card from panini lux seven of ten black card gold border with silver ink oh god <laughs> I love Lux. Yeah, that's yeah. so sweet. Signs the LA underneath it too. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. I totally forgot that one was seven of ten too. Yeah. So I think they're both seven of ten. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's so nice. Yeah. So, anyways, I had to show those off real quick, and uh, I think we'll jump right into the Dolphins Mount Mont- Rushmore. Should we get uh, Daisy on the line? Ring, ling, ding, dong. <laughs> All right, we got Daisy on the line at Twin Z Trouble, going to help us out with the Dolphins Mount Rushmore. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. A little early, but that's why I get my coffee. <laughs> right, right. We appreciate you coming yeah. on. Definitely. Um, so uh, we know that you're uh, um, getting ready to go through a little bit of change here. Uh, I saw on your uh, Instagram post, and uh, did you want to share that a little bit? Um yeah, so I just uh, I've been in the military. You go, it's going. I'm actually coming up on 16 years. I'll hit 16 years in June. Um, something that I wanted to do ever since I was a young NCO was become a drill sergeant. Um, not really something I was actively pursuing as of late, but uh, I got selected by the Department of the Army um, whenever I was looking for a future assignments. Um, I saw that I got flagged for drill sergeant duty. It's probably because of a school that I just went to. Um, but it's something I'm really excited for, but because drill sergeant is so demanding and it's, um, very time consuming, it could be very daunting at times, a lot of stress on the family. Um, but the good thing is, is that it will take us back, uh, to the East coast cause me and the wife are from the Southeastern United States, my wife's actually from Dominican Republic, but a lot of her family's in Florida, Georgia. Um, oh, okay. a lot of my family's in Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. Um, so getting us back to where we actually just came from before we moved up here to the Seattle area, um, we were actually in the Columbus, Georgia area, which is where we're going to go back to. Um, well, you're so about as far away from home good, as um, possible. Uh, say again? I said you're about, as far, you're about as far away from home as possible in the United States. Uh, I mean, it could be Alaska or oh, know, yeah. Hawaii, which I mean, Hawaii wouldn't be bad because it's the same climate or it could be Korea. You know, or oh, Germany, yeah. or somewhere overseas. But as far as uh, continental U.S., yeah, we're literally in the opposite corner. Yeah, it's yeah. 2,743 miles. From, <laughs> wow. Uh, wow. I drive where folks to live. Um, 
but it's good because the wife will have a little we'll have a little bit more of a support system there with the family being closer um they'll actually get to see grandparents and you know oh, nice. brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and cousins and stuff so we're really excited about it, but it's just that the school is very, very demanding because you have to memorize so much because with the drill sergeant, you're literally teaching soldiers that are coming in, brand new civilians that are coming in how to be a soldier. So it's starting from how to stand up the position of attention, how to salute, how to literally do anything and everything that is Army. So you have to memorize how to pitch each one of those classes on how to do it. So that's why wow. it's very... And me being a perfectionist, I want to make sure that I've already started reading the regulation and, and uh, the drill sergeant tasks and the manual and all that stuff. So I'm trying to memorize all that stuff before I get there. So when I get there, it's just like second nature for me. Um, so that's what I'm trying to focus on um, is that because I know it, it's it's a no fail option for me. Like everybody's like, are you sure? And I was like, you know, I won't fail. I was like, I'll let it kill me before before I fail. Right. Um, I'm, I'm just a big perfectionist like that. So I'm really excited for it. My wife knows that I'm really looking forward to it, but biggest thing of all is because it's going to get us out of here and, and back home, like exactly right where we want to be. Cause after I finish drill sergeant, my drill sergeant duty, I'll, I'll only have like about two years left before I can submit my retirement packet. So oh, okay. that's if I want to do 20, if I want to do more than 20, then, uh, so I told the wife, I was like, we'll see about that. I'll see how the body feels. Cause <laughs> right. You know, this long and being in many combat tours and, and many injuries that I sustained, it's just like I don't know if my body wants to go any more than twenty years. Right, right. Well, that's awesome. You were uh, um, selected for it, and congrats on that. And uh, we want to thank you for your yeah, service. Thanks, thanks we, so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So maybe we'll jump into the uh, topic on hand. We're super excited to see your uh, Dolphins Mount Rushmore, your honorable mentions. Um, yes. we're excited, man. I, I, uh, I love watching your, um, your channel and your Instagram and, and I know it's going to be good. I, I just know. Yeah. I, I, like I said, I was up late last night making sure I had everything good. Um, just some notes so I don't get kind of scatterbrained and start going off topic. And we turn this, you know, short interview into, <laughs> cause I can talk all day about the dolphins. And oh, yeah. like I mentioned previously, I had to reach out to one of my buddies who's a huge dolphins fan and we had, I had to put my biases aside, his biases aside to come up with a list that why each of these people deserves to be where they're at with another honorable mention, which is the Jersey I'm wearing, um, more of a recent player, um, who's no longer with the team, unfortunately, but you know, we can get to that whenever we get on that subject. Sure. Sure. So yeah, whatever you want to jump in, we'll, well, I think we'll start with honorable mentions. Is that good? Yeah. Honorable mentions is good. All right. Um, so first honorable mention uh, is going to be Mark Clayton. He's one of the the Mark brothers. Uh, he was drafted. He's a wide receiver drafted in 83. Uh, he's drafted in the eighth round, the 223rd pick overall. Um, Five-time pro bowler, two NFL receiving touchdown leaders in uh, 84 and 88. Uh, career, uh, 582 receptions, 8,974 yards, 84 touchdowns. He's tied 39th for receiving yards. Tied, or, uh, he's 13th for touchdowns all time. Um, he holds the Dolphins record for most receiving yards and touchdowns in a single season. Um, and then he was one of the, he was Dan Marino's favorite target whenever they played together. Um, and they were actually named one of the most prolific tandems, um, of their time whenever they played and probably still today. Um, just all the things that they did. Um, and he was paired with Mark Duper, um, Mark Super Duper, um, to form the Mark brothers, which was pretty awesome. Um, and at the end, something that was really interesting, um, at the end, uh, if you guys watch Dan Marino's hall of fame speech, um, right at the end of his speech, Clayton was actually in the crowd and he ran through the crowd, uh, and Dan Marino threw a pass from the stage. Um, so that Mark Clayton could catch one last pass from the oh, Hall of Fame quarterback. Cool. Oh, awesome. so, <laughs> yeah. It's it's pretty cool. Um, really good. Uh, next, we have Mark Super Duper. Obviously, if you have one Mark brother, you have to have the other. Mm -hmm. um, he was drafted the year before. Same position. He was drafted the year before uh, Mark Clayton was. He was drafted in the second round. He was the 73rd overall pick. Um, he's a three-time Pro Bowler, 511 uh, career receptions, 808, uh, eight, or sorry, 8,869 yards, 59 touchdowns. Um, his best season was in 84 and 86. In 84, he had 71 receptions for over 1,300 yards. 86, he had 67 receptions for over 1,300 yards. 
Wow. Uh, and 11 touchdowns. Um, he had four uh, seasons with 1,000-plus yards, and he's the only uh, only the second Dolphin to eclipse 7,000 um, receiving yards. Um, another interesting fact about him was he was actually diagnosed with CTE, um, and he came out of, uh, about it and disclosed that he was diagnosed with CTE on, in November of 2013. If you guys aren't familiar with what CTE is, um, if you're familiar with the movie Concussion, what they were finding out was wrong with the players from getting all those hits over so many years. Um, that's what, which is kind of sad um, yeah. that he was diagnosed with CTE. Um, I can relate to being in the, my military career and my occupation. I can relate to brain trauma because um, I do suffer from TBI and, and uh, PTSD and stuff like that. Um, our third honorable mention was who I wanted to be on Mount Rushmore, but that you know there was somebody that took his spot. Um, <laughs> Jason Taylor, defensive end, mm. absolutely monster dude. Yes. Um, I have a lot of stats here on the sheet. Um, so I'm going to try to go through just as quick as I can. Um, he was drafted in 97. This is one of the guys that I grew up watching, like absolutely loved Jason Taylor, um, watched Dan Marino towards the end of his career. Um, but he was the third pick, um, 73rd overall. He was inducted in the hall of fame in 2017, as you guys know, um, fourth most all time for forced fumbles with 47, uh, tied first, uh, all time for fumble recoveries with 29. Seven all-time uh, sack leader with 139.5 sacks. All-time leader in fumble recoveries for a touchdown at his position with six. And then also uh, number one overall in his position for touchdowns, uh, return for touchdowns, which is three. Um, he was the NFL de- uh, Defensive Player of the Year in 2006. Uh, he was the Walt Payton Man of the Year in 2007. And he was all in the 2000s All-Decade team. Um, had a really great career, uh, obviously absolute monster on the field. Mm. Um, NFL sack leader in 2002, uh, six time pro bowler, his career, uh, he had 775 career tackles. Interesting fact that a lot of people don't know, um, is that, uh, Jason Taylor is actually married to Zach Thomas's sister. Oh, really? Oh, wow. <laughs> he is. He's married. A lot of people didn't know that. Um, a lot of people, that's something that I found out, um, uh, it was a few years ago I actually found out about it. I was reading an article. It was right after he was inducted in the Hall of Fame. I was reading an article and found out that I knew him and Jason uh, or Zach Thomas were really close, but I did not know that he actually married his sister. So right. when I found out, I was like, that's pretty cool. Like, yeah. you know, uh-huh. you play with your sister like this. Like, does that cross the boundaries? Does it not? You know, it's <laughs> it's it's really interesting. Yeah. So then speaking of Zach Thomas, the last honorable mention um, that I have on the list is Zach Thomas. Um, this guy was – absolute monster uh, on the field as well at his position uh middle linebacker um a dude that i really liked i used to have one of his um um ultimate jerseys the orange one i wore that all the time every uh sunday with my uncle and you know um, my uncle was a dolphins fan my dad's not my dad's a kansas city chiefs fan so so i told <laughs> alan when we first started uh, or when we first started when i first started doing it, i was like most of my family's chiefs fans and he's like well, what's wrong with you and i was just like <laughs> hey, damn marie i grew up not far from the stadium. I was like, I grew up watching Dan Marino and the Mark brothers and, uh, Zach Thomas and, you know, Jason Taylor and all those guys, Ricky Williams also, you know, a, a lot of, a lot of really great guys, um, yeah. come through. And I was like, we're the only team that has a perfect season. Yeah. I know that happened in seven two and I don't <laughs> like to live in the past, but I mean, we're the only team to do that. So, right. Um, so Zach Thomas, so do you pop, uh, the, do, you, do you pop 96? Say again. I was just gonna say, do you pop champagne when when the last undefeated? I always root for you know. I'd, I'd like to see somebody break the record, but maybe you know after Shula and all the '72 uh, Dolphins guys are are long gone, you know. But yeah. I, I hope it, I hope it gets beat by anybody but Tom Brady because I just <laughs> you know, right. Dolphins, I root against them every single year. Can't deny you know his talent and Bill Belichick's talent, one of the greatest football minds of all time, but. I just, I can't root for him. I, I can't, I can't. I root mean, against him every single time. Oh, yeah. Um, I can completely but, understand that. That would be like us rooting for the Packers or the Bears or, you know, inner division. You just, you, there's too much hate there. <laughs> um, I forgot one of the, I think it was Mark Clayton. Mark Clayton, maybe it was Mark Duper. I can't remember which one. Um, 
they're one of the only one of three uh, receivers to ever receive or catch a touchdown pass from Marino or Far. Marino and Far. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm trying to remember who it was. I want to say it was. I want to say uh, Clayton play, finished his career with the Packers. I think so. But I, say, I want to say it was Clayton. I, I missed that in my notes, but I want to say that it was Clayton that because I think he finished out his like as like the last last year, last two years with the the Packers, and then he came back and ended up retiring with the Dolphins. Yeah, that um, sounds right. He was yeah. the only one, to, uh, one of the few receivers to catch a touchdown pass from both uh, Marino and Favre, which was actually pretty awesome. Too. Yeah, um, yeah. Both, prolific quarterbacks in that era especially um but zach thomas he was drafted in 96 the fifth round 154th overall pick i thought 154 was actually pretty ironic because his jersey number was 54 oh, um, yeah. coming out of texas tech you know we got a lot of guys that that are big on zach thomas because from texas tech um absolute monster as well too seven-time pro bowler um afc defensive rookie of the year um which was a big feat um nfl 2000s all decade team obviously um only two linebackers in history have more tackles combined tackles than zach thomas and that is going to be uh ray lewis and junior Seau. Oh, wow! and junior Seau is that obviously another great dolphin that i watched <laughs> growing up too um who was um diagnosed with cte and actually committed suicide um yeah. because of it um, well, at least that's what reports say. Excuse me. And then Ray Lewis coming out of the University of Miami, go you. Um, <laughs> third linebacker as well, too. So only two linebackers in the Hall of Fame are the only people that have more combined tackles than he does. So Zach Thomas has uh, 1,720 all-time. Ray Lewis has 2,061. And then Junior Seau has 1,846. Wow. So pretty big feat. Yeah. Um, and then he has 20.5 sacks over uh, all time, 17 interceptions, four pick sixes, 17 forced fumbles, eight re- uh, fumble recoveries. Why this guy is not in the Hall of Fame, I have no idea. If you check his stat line, he's very close to um, Brian Erlacher. In some categories, he's a little bit less. In some categories, he's actually a lot more. But for Zach Thomas not to be in the Hall of Fame, I'm one of his big, biggest supporters. I'm hoping that he gets put in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. I absolutely love what he did. Just absolute monster. Him and Jason Taylor playing together. Just The Dolphins, after Marino left, it's the, the Dolphins were more known for their defense than they were their offense because we didn't have any. I don't think anybody will ever replace Dan Marino or anybody that we had on the offense, but our defense has always been known um, down in Southern Florida. Um mm-hmm. In college and in, in professional, because you look at all the, the big defensive players that came out of the University of Miami in the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, just a lot of Hall of Famers, a lot of big talent. Oh, wow. our 11 of our starters got drafted um, in 2004, a lot of them, and then the late 90s too. Um, and also his run or the linebacker class that Zach Thomas was drafted with was actually Ray Lewis, Teddy Bruschi, uh, Donnie Edwards and Kevin Hardy. So a lot of big wow. names that yeah. he actually was drafted with and to have as good a career as he did with all those other guys as well. Um, it is even more reason for him to get put in the hall of fame because he had a lot of competition to, to outshow and getting defensive, uh, uh, rookie of the year over Ray Lewis and Teddy Bruschi is just like, you know, and Ray Lewis is in the freaking hall of fame. So why can't that? Be? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> So the other honorable mention would be Cameron Wake, someone uh, as of late on the defensive side of the ball is Cameron Wake. He was actually uh, undrafted and picked up by uh, Miami. He went to Penn State for a little bit, then he transferred to the um, University of Michigan. Absolute monster on the field. Um, He was the the staple of our defense for so long. Um, Then they brought in Sue and we got rid of Olivier Vernon, uh, who's actually from the University of Miami, and whenever Cameron Wake got hurt, Olivier Vernon really took off. Um, Jared Audrick also, um, and then we picked up Sue for that big contract. I don't know why we did that, because I think our defense was a little bit worse than it was before we had Sue. Um, but got hurt at a old I think he was 32 when he got hurt, and then he came back that next season and, and was number four on the, the sack uh, list for the, the year in the NFL, wow. which being that old and being able to come from an Achilles, a ruptured Achilles, yeah. and still being able to play at that level is 
something yeah. amazing. But, you know, he got older and Miami didn't want to give him money. And so he went to uh, Tennessee with uh, Ryan Tannehill. And, he, and look at what Cameron Wake's doing and what Ryan Tannehill's doing in Tennessee. <laughs> right. so, uh, I know uh, yeah. me and my kid were looking and, like, Cameron Wake's, like, 37 and he started out the season with, like, three sacks on the first game or something <laughs> like that. It's like, holy cow. Okay, he's, he's a monster. He's an absolute beast. And yeah. I'm, I'm really big on dudes that are undrafted because they have the most to prove. They didn't, go out there and they, they play their heart out because they know that it could be the very last game. Didn't he? Like, uh, Philip Lindsay, another undrafted dude um, that I absolutely love watching. Um, Preston Williams, he was the receiving leader in FBS yep. and uh, was not drafted, and we we picked him up. Um, so I'm a big fan of undrafted guys because I think obviously they have a lot of better careers than some of the drafted guys do. Because you see a lot of these first round, second round guys that are complete busts, Did and you... then you get these undrafted dudes that play their heart out every single day because they know tomorrow's never promised. Didn't Cam- um, and that's what I really like about some of these some of these players. Didn't Cameron Wake go and play like a couple of years in the Canadian Football League and was like defensive player of the year like a year or two mm-hmm. up there? Yeah, yep. yeah. I like Cameron Wake's story and I always yep. liked him. So I'm saying he's there's a lot of people that, that didn't get drafted and he loved football, went and played for the Canadian Football League before he signed for the Dolphins and came on to the Dolphins and like I said, an absolute beast, one of the best defensive ends that we've seen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um he was, like I said, he was the anchor of the defense. And then, you know, we had Minka Fitzpatrick, and he was a very prolific player. But, you know, when you, you don't get along with coach and, and, you know, you have certain family members that, that want to, you know, trash the, the coaching staff and the ownership, just like look at Brett Grimes. His wife's the one that lost his job at, uh, lost his job uh, with Miami. Mm-hmm. Um, but, he, and look at what he's doing in freaking Pittsburgh. Yeah. Absolutely paired up in Pittsburgh, which sucks because I I, I invested a lot of money <laughs> in my piece for Minka Fitzpatrick. And then the, when the talk straight had started coming, I was like, hold up, let me stop trying to collect these rainbows because yeah. I'm starting to get towards like the one of ones and the fives and the tens. Yeah. And I'm going to start dumping hundreds of dollars. And then <laughs> not, he's not going to be on the team anymore. And sure enough, he, he ended up getting traded. And I'm just like, come oh, on, man. Oh, man. And then 10 straight. I was never a huge – I was a big Mika supporter, um, but I was never a big Kenny and Drake fan. And he got traded, and I was like, well, you know, there goes like 40% of my PC because I I don't – I never bought Kenny and Drake, but just because he was one of the, the most produced players uh, from Panini. Yep. Um, I had a lot of Kenny and Drake and a lot of, a lot of big cards, a lot of good cards, a lot of unique cards. Right. Um, so after those two happened, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to start buying people that – our old school. I'm not going to buy any current players. You know, if I get a good deal or I get in some breaks and I get rookies, that's fine. But I'm not going to go out of my way to invest in rookies anymore. Um, and that's actually a conversation I had with Jim and JD too. He's like, I don't collect any of the new guys. If if I pull them, that's fine. But I won't go out of my way to buy an autograph or a mem card because they don't stay with the team very long. And right. he was telling me that his Emmett Smith collection was like, I think he said something like 200, maybe it was 700 some autographs of Emmett Smith, like his Emmett PC is oh, just wow. so huge. And I'm like, that's where I'm trying to be. You know, yeah. I, I, I have a lot of, <laughs> I, you saw the cards that I have, you know, I, I don't have, I don't have any Merino autos, which I'm still looking for a Merino auto. Sure. Uh, a local guy here actually pulled out of prism, the Merino finite. Oh. One of one. Oh, oh, out of a car shop here. Not my LCS one. That's about uh, 40 minutes from here. It's on the other side of the base. Um, where my buddy lives, it's about ten minutes from my buddy uh, Greg, the one that helped me with the list. Oh yeah. Um, and he showed me that, and I just I got sick to my stomach. And I'm like, man, oh, man. I said, what if I would have walked? Because I've gone there a couple of times. Like, what if I would have gone to that shop? That would have been and bought yeah. that. Like, I've pulled some really big marinos, but never an auto. It's it's just a mem patch. Yeah. Um, but another honorable mention I would probably say for the Dolphins on the offense would be Ricky Williams. Um, phenomenal running back uh, it's just unfortunate you know what happened to him um and i think it's kind of funny because if you look at a lot of his his autograph memorabilia especially his mini helmets um you'll see where it says from heisman to high man um he'll sign ricky williams smoke weed every day uh <laughs> some some you know some funny some funny you know comical relief i was like yeah it's unfortunate you know that you, you smoked weed and and you, you got banned from the nfl but he was a really good player and, you know, a face of the Miami offense for quite a while, you yeah. know, in the early 2000s. Um, 
absolutely love that dude and i have quite a few of his cards as well too Awesome. So if we go past the honorable mentions and get on to Mount Rushmore. Yes. So all of these guys are going to be from the 72 Dolphins. Um, reason being was just because that was like the Dolphins are always known for the perfect season. They're always known for Don Shula and Bob Greasy, you know, and uh, a lot of these players that, that helped get the perfect season. But also um, Don Shula being able to – re-engineer a lot of them to be the hall of fame players or re-engineer them to completely revolutionize um the positions that they played so the first one obviously being coach shula so he joined the dolphins in 1970 and he coached all the way up until 95 and then after 95 that's when jimmy johnson who was also another big you know you coach and miami coach um he transformed the team after he came in 1970 he absolutely transformed the team um he he's the winningest coach of all time um, to this day. Still, I bill a check. If he keeps playing, he might potentially pass, surpass Don Shula as of right now. Um, he's still the winningest coach of all time. So just the stat line for him, uh, regular season, he has 328 career wins with 156 losses and six ties. So he's at a six, seven, six um, record uh, postseason. He's 19 and 17 record the postseason record is not as great um but that's still on the positive side it's above 500 it's at 528 and then so that puts him at a career of 347 to 173 and six so for a career of 665 which is pretty good for oh, yeah. being a coach that long um he was four-time apa coach uh in a uh, nfl coach of the year and then he's obviously on the 90s all decade team um the second one which is who he really helped revolutionize that position was Larry Zonka um, or Zonk as they started calling him. So his early in his career, he was drafted. Um, he was drafted in 68. Uh, he was in the first round, the eighth pick overall. Um, he's in both college and the NFL hall of fame. He was inducted in the hall of fame. Actually the year I was born in 87. Um, but uh, he had a very rough career. He used to lead with his head and, and, charged with his head and not his arm or his body. Um, and that's one of the things that um, Coach Shula and the offensive coordinator, um, who was it? I'm trying to read my notes here. Coach Tessif. I'm hoping I'm saying that right. Coach Tessif. So Don Shula and Coach Tessif actually helped him run. Like, this is how you need to run. You need to lead with your arms. You need to lead with your body. Helped him, developed him, re-engineered him in a sense to be the Hall of Fame player that he was. Um, so early on, he got a lot of concussions, broken nose, um, broken jaw, busted his eardrum a lot because wow. he was always leading with his head and, yeah. and in a sense, like running into a brick wall head first. Um, but after the coaching from Tessa and, and Shula, he was known as a bulldozer or uh, a batting ram because he would just absolutely power through dudes and, and drag an entire team through the mud, um, and get an extra five or six yards. Um, he was uh, obviously, you know, two-time Super Bowl champ, Super Bowl seven and eight. Uh, he was a Super Bowl, Super Bowl eight MVP. So that's a big feat. So a dude yeah. that started off really early as not being that great of a player, and then uh, Don Shula came in and helped him get Super Bowl eight MVP, five-time Pro Bowler, comeback player of the year in '79. So after the Dolphins, he went to I want to say it was like something similar to like the Canadian Football League. I don't think it was the Canadian Football League back then. Um, but he left the Dolphins um, and went to um, the I, I, another football league, I guess, and then ended up coming back in, to the Dolphins in '79, um, where he was playback play uh, uh, player comeback of the year or comeback player of the year. Sorry, uh, playback comeback of the year in '79, and then uh, after that year, the Dolphins and him couldn't agree on a contract, so he ended up just retiring in '79, and they actually retired his number. Uh, they retired uh, number 39. So there are quite a few guys from 72 and from the 80s that played with Miami that their numbers are retired, and that's why you don't see those numbers or we'll never see those numbers again. Right. Um, let's see. He was an outstanding pass blocker. Um, like I said, revolutionized the position. Uh, and then we have Bob Greasy. So the quarterback <laughs> who led, uh, led the Dolphins to Super Bowl seven and Super Bowl eight victories. Um, drafted in 67, he was the fourth overall pick. Uh, inducted in the Hall of Fame in 1990. 
uh, three consecutive appearances. So he's only, he was the first quarterback to do uh, to accomplish that three consecutive Super Bowls. Since then, uh, Tom Brady and Jim Kelly um, are the ones to go to back to back to back Super Bowl appearances. Um, he's only one of three quarterbacks from Purdue to win a Super Bowl. The other being Lynn Dawson and Drew Brees. Um, so that's an interesting uh, fact as well. Um, and then six-time Pro Bowler, NFL MVP in 71, passing touchdown leader in 77, and then also, again, Dolphins retired number 12. Um, so Bob Greasy was good for many, many years, great for many years. Um, someone that you can definitely remember um, from the 72 team, uh, along with uh, Larry Zonka and this next guy. Um Nick Budakani. So everybody knows he passed away uh, this past June, unfortunate. Um, he was diagnosed with CTE, dementia. Um, but this person was someone that I wanted to put on here just because everything he did outside of the NFL. Um, a lot of people don't know that his son, Mark, played for the Citadel. And he actually had a spine injury um, in 85. He suffered a spinal cord injury from tackling um, and ended up becoming quadriplegic. Oh, wow. um, in uh, 85. So he was the co-founder of the Miami Project to Cure Paralysis, and that uh, organization is now one of the world's leading um, researchers in, uh, paral- or in uh, um, neurology um, and neurological research um, uh, centers. He also started the flag football movement for... Um, Kids under the age of 14 not tackling in football because the the child's mind or the brain is still not quite developed yet. And to have them suffer concussions and some of the things that he suffered through his career, um, he was trying to prevent that uh, for kids at a young age. So he was a big supporter um, of that. Um, but he was um, drafted in 62 um, he was actually drafted by the Patriots uh, in 62, um, and then he ended up coming over to the Dolphins. He played, I want to say he played three or four years with the Patriots before he came to the Dolphins. Um, he was the 13th, uh, uh, round 13, the 102nd overall pick, NFL Hall of Fame in 2001. Um, he played with the Dolphins, he, so he played with the Pats for seven years. Played with the Dolphins um, from 69 to 74, and then again in 76. Two-time Super Bowl champ again. Um, part of the perfect season in 72, two-time Pro Bowler in 72 and 73. So the same season that we went to the Super Bowl, he made it to the Pro Bowl. Uh, he had a career 183 games with 32 interceptions. Um, his leadership on the Dolphins made him one of the cornerstones of the defense. Absolute leadership. Um, I was actually reading um, um, some of the stuff that his players, uh, the other players and coaches said about Bunakani, whenever he was on the team, he cared about everybody. Um, he was his leadership style was next to none. Um, they have never dealt with anybody that was as professional and, and cared as much and had the leadership qualities that that Nick did. And that's something that is really hard to find, um, especially with some of the newer players, because some of the newer players, you know, they they get kind of self righteous, self centered, selfish. You know, mm-hmm. um, they they care about them. It's all about me. What what have you done for me lately? Not what has you know what can I do for the team, um, and it, it's today it's all about money. Like back then, it was about the heart and the drive, and you know wanting to win and, and play the game. And today, it's more focused on money, which is kind of sad. Um, but again, that's kind of why I, I like watching college a little bit more. Excuse me, college a little bit more than NFL, because with the defensive ends, especially or not the defensive ends, the defensive backs uh, especially, and the wide receivers. It's becoming more of, you know, Antonio Browns and, you know, the, def- the cornerbacks and all that kind of stuff. It's, 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 it's all eyes on me. Like, I have to be the center of attention or I'm going to throw a fit. And it's very unfortunate. Um, you get some of the younger guys, too. Like, look what happened to Johnny Menzel. Um, great college football player. And then, and then let the money get to his head and made bad decisions. And it's just like you have every opportunity and you have all this talent, God-gifted talent and you throw it away because you get a little bit of money mm-hmm. and you know it, it's very unfortunate yeah. um but talking about uh mount rushmore and i know a lot of 
a lot of Dolphins fans are going to be like, oh, you're, you're messed up because you didn't put Reno <laughs> on Mount Rushmore. Like, you're right. I didn't put him on Mount Rushmore because, like I told you guys when, we, when you first started talking about the interview, there are a thousand people. I can think of eight right off the top of my head that I would want to put on Mount Rushmore. Right. So six honorable mentions, the four big ones, and the two, the two other ones. Um, the Mount Rushmore – um, those people earn the spot. Dan Marino, if I could have a fifth on there, obviously, yes, he would be. But Dan Marino is the face of the franchise, hands down, yep. face of the franchise. Whenever you hear Dolphins, you're always going to remember number 13. You're always going to remember Dan Marino because he was one of the most prolific players ever. His arm, his his, his football IQ, just some of the crazy plays that he did, you know, the, the fake spike. <laughs> uh, one of his most memorable plays that he did. Mm-hmm. Um, Aaron Rodgers actually pulled the Marino. Uh, I can't remember <laughs> what game it was, but he pulled the Marino, the fake spike. Uh-huh. Um, but NFL uh, Hall of Fame quarterback. And even though he never won a Super Bowl, went to the Super Bowl many times, never won a Super Bowl, still holds a lot of records, uh, uh, close to a dozen records that he still holds in the NFL. Not all time, but, you know, top five, top ten at least, um, some of the records. And despite never winning a Super Bowl, still considered one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. Um, and for a, one, for not being for not winning a Super Bowl and being in the Hall of Fame, that is, that is a huge feat because how many other quarterbacks are in the Hall of Fame that haven't won? Uh, a Super Bowl. There's not very many, right. but Dan Marino definitely is the face of the franchise for the Dolphins. Every time you hear Dolphins, you're always going to think of Dan Marino. You might think of Shula, you might think of 72 uh, Dolphins, but honestly, you could go to anybody on the street and they're going to know who Dan Marino is. They're probably not going to know who Nick Munakani is. They're probably not going to know who Larry Zonka is. Maybe Bob Greasy, probably Don Shula, but hands down, everybody's going to know who Dan Marino is. Right. Because he's just one of the most electrifying quarterback set of his generation and a really outstanding dude. Um, a guy that I really like. Um, like I said, I, I really enjoyed watching him and, and the Mark brothers growing mm. up. And then after they left, you know, the, the Zach Thomas and Jason Taylor, and that's when uh, right. you'll never see me with an offensive jersey. The only offensive jersey I have is um, Dan Marino. Um but all my other jerseys are defensive players just because I'm I'm a big defense guy. Nice, I'm nice. <laughs> and Dolphins are known for their defense now. They're not known for their offense, you know? Right. Uh, you have somebody that worked under uh, Bilicek, the dynasty, you know, and, uh, and Flores. So people are criticizing them heavy, talking about tanking and this and that and the other. And do I think they're tanking? Uh, there's been some plays where I'm questioning, you know, like maybe they really are tanking, but you know, just the excitement from when we got our first win and when we got our second win, mm-hmm. um, the genuine excitement just to see that sparkle in the coach's eyes for getting his first win as a head coach. It's, yeah. it's like, I find it hard to believe, you know, with, with that being that genuine on a win that they're actually trying to tank. Um, and, I know we need a lot of help on the offense. We need a little bit of help on the defense. And I'm hoping that with Flores as head coach now, he knows what he's doing. We did get a lot of draft picks for Tunzel. I wasn't really happy about it. But I understand the method behind the madness. Think of Minka Fitzpatrick, same thing. I know we got a lot of picks from him. We got a lot of picks from Tunzel. We got a lot of picks for a lot of things. So Dolphins don't have a great track record when it comes to drafting. So I'm hoping <laughs> that Flores can change that. Yeah, hopefully. Um, I really hope us can change that and i know it's going to be a few years like probably four to five years before the dolphins become relevant again um and honestly this year i haven't watched much football not professional football anyways i just with everything with antonio brown and a lot of the other stuff going on in the league garrett uh miles garrett a lot of that stuff it's like come on man I, I actually watched that game and when i saw that i'm just like what in the world like that there's a lot of stuff that happens that, you know, a lot of people don't look at, but I'm just like the, the a lapse of judgment just ruined your career. Yep. Um, and it's very, very unfortunate, but you know, I'm, I'm always going to root for the dolphins. You know, I'm always saying, you know, we're, we're going to, I still say it today. I was like, you know, we're, we're going to come back and then we're going to sneak that last wild card spot. And then we're going <laughs> to win the Super Bowl and we're gonna have to, 
deplete my savings to go <laughs> to the Super Bowl. It is in Miami this year, and I'm just like, to attend the Super Bowl in Miami and have Miami in the Super Bowl, I'm like, that's that's my dream. I was like, I'm, you know, I'm happy. I, I, I can die tomorrow and, and be happy because I've seen the Dolphins play in the Super Bowl in Miami. Yeah. You know, is, is that really going to happen? <laughs> no, but I can dream, you know. Right. I, I can hope and hope that helps me look forward to next year. Yeah. You know, yep. and it's like then it's count down to, to next season um, right. in the draft and, and seeing what's coming on. And, you know, Tua obviously got hurt and everybody's talking about taking for Tua. And um, do I hope we draft Tua? No. I really don't think that he's as good as some people say he is. He, he struggles a lot with better defenses. Um, and he's a lefty. There hasn't been a lefty on an active roster since Michael Vick. And if you try to compare two to Mike Vick, you are smoking something because he's not anywhere near Michael Vick. I think the only person that you could kind of consider close to Mike Vick would be Lamar Jackson, um, recent quarterbacks. Right. Um, just of his style of play and, and how he plays. And then before him was, um, I believe it was Steve. Steve Young was lefty. I want to say Steve Young was lefty. Yep. Yeah, he was. Um, and then Boomer Sison, those were the only other three lefties that had successful careers. Mm -hmm. So there's not very many people that are lefties. And his release is slow. Um, and, you know, it, like I said, he just struggles. And not only that, he just he dislocated his hip from from a play from getting hit. And a hip injury, that, that's your trunk, that's your base. That's where everything is, is coming from. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if he'll ever be able to fully recover from a hip injury. Right. Um, it's like it's when you get it get injured once like that that's something to, to recover from like a hip fractures or something i see a lot in the military and you never recover from a hip fracture no um especially in football where you use your legs a lot like right. he'll never be as mobile as he was he'll never right. be because there always be always be that that chance of re-injuring himself so right. i think that that he could have done something great and i you know i could be wrong i've been wrong before but you know i think he's going to fall off the draft boards and Maybe he'll be a late round pick. Maybe we'll pick him up late, and maybe he'll maybe. be undrafted and he'll get picked up late. And then maybe he'll surprise somebody and be a franchise quarterback someday. I don't know. <laughs> right, uh, right. Or, but I just hope you know that we focus on other areas before we focus on a quarterback. Um, a quarterback that I'm really looking at is Lawrence out of Clemson. Yep. Um, hopefully he doesn't declare this year, and hopefully he waits another year just to develop a little bit more. Um, but from and. Hubert from Oregon State, from from Georgia. I don't. Uh, maybe Jalen Hurts. Those are kind of the top end guys, but I really don't see any any franchise quarterback in any of the draft class this year. Right. Um, potentially, but we need a lot of a lot of help on the O line. We need a little bit of help on on the defensive line. Uh, I think we're we're pretty decent at running back. We're pretty good on receivers. Um, but, you know, it, it can always help to add depth. But we need to start focusing on other areas before we actually draft another quarterback. Maybe so, maybe, uh, maybe if you uh, um, put those resources into the rest of the team, maybe Rosen might be your guy. And then and that's what I'm saying. Like, I was really, you know, the whole Rosen situation – they did them dirty. Like, I mean, I can understand Kingsbury, you know, wanting to get a guy that he was there with early in his career. But it's like you draft a Rosen, you know, in the first round last year. He didn't have an O-line. And it's like looking at the O-line, put any other great quarterback behind that line, Tom Brady, Brett Favre, anybody, any great quarterback, are they going to have a successful year? Are they going to have a winning record? Probably not because – the O-line is the staple of the offense. If you don't have an O-line, you can't block for passing. You can't block for rushing. You can't do anything. And it's like, without well, an O-line, you can't do anything. So to to be like, oh, he sucks, but really it's the offensive line that sucks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You can't be, gauge a guy's talent. And, I mean, look at Kyler Murray. Yeah, he's he's putting up great numbers, but look at the record. They're still right. not winning. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So whenever they, you know, they're talking about Rosen's our guy, Rosen's our guy, Rosen's our guy, I know you don't want to disclose your strategy with other teams. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, you have the number one overall pick. You have the number one overall pick. So people are going to have to sell their house and their kids and their dog <laughs> right. to, to try to get the number one spot. You could have done anything you wanted with that number one spot. And taking Murray number one overall, like that's that's – like that that's kind of dirty you know saying that this guy's our, our our guy and then draft night you give him a car like hey man you know we're sorry we're, we're gonna 
retract our statement saying that you're our guy and, and we're going to trade you to the Dolphins. Right. I was happy he came to us, and I'm like, he's got some talent. I mean, he does have talent, but seeing how they gave away our offensive staple, and I can understand the Lunzel, uh, the, uh, the Jeremy Tunzel, tra- or, uh, yeah, Jeremy Tunzel trade, um, because he was at the end of his rookie contract, and you don't want to make the highest player on your team an offensive lineman. Right. Usually the highest played player is going to be quarterback on offense and then maybe a defensive back on, on defense or a defensive end um, on, on defense. But to have an offensive lineman, the highest played person on your team, that's that's not really a good look. So I can kind of understand that. Um, but I don't know. Do I think Rose is going to be with us next year? I kind of hope so. I would really like to see them, you know, develop Rosen into a quarterback. You know, he's he, – he didn't get the start. Fitzpatrick got the start, and then um, Fitzpatrick started kind of turning down a little bit, and then they had Rosen start, or they would just have Rosen in as a cleanup after they're getting mopped, you know, 52 to nothing right. um, on the mop-up crew. And I was like, you can't really assess somebody on a mop-up crew. No. Uh, and then he's had a couple of starts and still wasn't playing that well. Um, but I really hope that they build everything else before they go and get a quarterback. Sure. Um because, I mean, I, look at the Browns. Like, the Browns, they got all that talent over the years because they sucked for so long. But not only <laughs> it's like you can't, you can't get all that talent and then switch coaching staffs and offensive coordinators, defensive coordinators year in and year out and expect your guys to have that cohesion, to have that teamwork, that development, to actually learn one style and build on it and – become a great unit you just can't you, you can't switch coaches every year and then expect to be good like right. why have the great uh why have the Brady's? why have the patriots might as well be the brady's why have the <laughs> patriots been so good for the last 20 years because belichick has been the head coach since freaking 2000 or maybe was it 99 or 2000 whenever he joined yeah. the patriots but he's been there for so long and his coaching staff really hasn't changed right like Flores was there um uh, what's his name? Uh, the offensive coordinator. Uh, dang it, I'm 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 yeah. having a, a Josh loss. Josh McDaniels. 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 There you yeah. go. Yeah. McDaniels. Dan Patricia was the defensive coordinator for so long, and he ended up taking uh, the head coaching job. Yeah. Um. Yep. So you know, it's like Billichek's been there forever. Brady's been there forever, and it's like Billichek is a no-nonsense coach. He's one of the greatest minds of all times. So he was under Bill Parcells for a while, and then you know he he saw a lot of great players, and he understands what it it means to because he's had a lot of no-name players but look how successful they've been with mm. a lot of you know no-name players here and there but right. look at the browns they have a lot of big names and they're not going anywhere because they get a new coach every freaking year <laughs> right and oh you know, it's like this year they just got a new coach freddie kitchens and like look at how everybody i was excited i was excited for the browns i was like you know what i'm gonna root for the browns this year because OBJ and Jarvis Landry, huge Jarvis Landry fan. I love Jarvis Landry. He was one of the great receivers on the Dolphins as a late. They, you know, it was, he started expressing his concern with the team. And the the threat that Gase always gave out is like, if you keep talking, I'm going to trade you to the Browns because no one wanted to go to the Browns because the Browns suck. <laughs> it's not because of the players. It's just because of the system. They didn't have a functioning system. Yeah. And he ended up going to the Browns. You know, and it's like he paired up with OBJ and you have Baker Mayfield. And, you know, I tell people that if Baker Mayfield focused more on football and, and less on commercials, he might actually be at the <laughs> same caliber as last year. But yep. that's another thing. It's like a lot of these sports athletes that are trying to go Hollywood and, and trying to get acting careers and making commercials and all this other stuff. It's like, look at how they 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 kind of descended and started to bottom out like a perfect example look at ronda rousey as soon as she started getting into she was one of the best female fighters of all time once when she started getting into hollywood and making movies it's like she, she <laughs> lost focus and, yeah. and got knocked out a kick right to the face she was hungry because she ate every single part of that foot um you know <laughs> so, just, like, that's that's a, a thing with a lot of these young kids is they, they lose focus that like going back to what i was talking about before they they don't they don't love football anymore. They love the money because right. now if they get money, you know, and they're making millions of dollars. It's like, how much can you pay me? And it's like, well, why don't you perform before I pay you? And I was like, I think that's how it should be. Right. Like, me being in the military, going overseas, you know, and not knowing if I'm going to wake up tomorrow or come home to my family at the end of the day or the end of the tour or whatever. 
She's like, we don't get paid much. Like people think that military people make a lot. I, I don't. I've been in 15 years and before taxes, I barely clear $76,000, barely clear $76,000. And that's with all the pay raises and, and the rank and all that other stuff. And it's like, we, we, we don't make that much. Like a private coming in the military, being 18 years old, going overseas, fighting for his country, doesn't even make minimum wage. Doesn't even make minimum wage. And, and that's what sucks. And you have these athletes that they're, they're entertainers. At the end of the day, that's what they are. They're entertainers. Yeah. And, you know, people that wear the number 12 um, have pacified the sport, in my opinion. You know, Aaron Rodgers and uh, Tom Brady. You know, they were crybabies, so they pacify the sport because I remember in the old days, you just crush people. Like, here comes the boom. You know, you just see those. Now you can't even you can't even tackle a quarterback without getting a flag. I understand it. You're trying to protect them. But I'm like, these people get paid millions of dollars. If yeah. they don't play another game in their entire career, they'll be okay. Right. Me, on the other hand, it's like, if I get hurt, yeah. well, you know, I don't have – I don't get paid millions of dollars. I – barely make minimum wage i make a little bit above minimum wage yeah. every year yeah but you know at the end of the day it's like if i do get hurt you know they just cut me a pink slip and say hey have a nice life and you know the va sucks and you know you're, <laughs> oh, you're gonna dude. struggle your whole life and you know yeah it's, it, tough. it's, it's really unfortunate so yeah a lot of these guys it's like i just can't understand like why are you guys crying like you are very fortunate you have a gift a talent and you get paid to do what you love. I get paid to do what I love. I absolutely love the military. That's, that's like the military was my first wife, you know? Yeah. So that's why I told the wife, I was like, military has always been there for me. It's always looked out for me. Yes, it sucks at times. And sometimes I just want to be like, screw it. I quit. I don't want to do this anymore. But it's like, I've got five, a little, little under five years left until I can be like, you know what? I did my 20. I get a check for the rest of my life, multiple checks because I get my retirement check and I'll get my disability check and I'll get my check from the VA. So right. it's like, I'll be collecting. It's not money. Won't be an issue. It's where do I get money from now? Is it millions and hundreds of thousands of dollars? No, but you know, two grand, three grand, four grand, whatever it may be, depending on percentages is better than zero. For sure. You know what I'm saying? I'm, like, I'm still going to continue to work after my military career. I've already got another job. Uh oh there we uh, go <laughs> yeah, yeah, I for a second i had somebody calling me oh okay um but i have another job down in florida um that's why i'm trying to go back down to the georgia area so that we can start looking at a retirement home and you know cool. looking looking to, to work another 20 after uh, i get out of the military so <laughs> right. i'm two retirements by the age of 58 nice because um, i retire from the army i retire from the army when i'm 38 years old nice. if i do 20 years nice. you know i have two retirements by 38 have four checks coming in and then I open up my own fish and charter business and still work, but do something that I enjoy doing it. And, you know, charging people an arm and a leg and half a body to, <laughs> to go fishing and people will pay it because it's Southern Florida and they don't know what they're doing. And I do. So, yeah. you know, I'm still making good money, but I'm on the beach, you know, on the water, getting drunk and fishing all day. You can't see, but there's a picture behind me. And I always tell everybody like, what's that picture of? And I was like, that's my backyard from my retirement home. Nice. It's a dock overlooking the water with a beach and a boat. And I'm like, yep, yeah, that's that's my retirement home. Awesome. So, well, Daisy, I'm going to um, jump in here because we, uh, we're we rolling into the 50-minute mark here. So, so <laughs> um, right, man. No, yeah, man, it's awesome. Uh, we could go on all day here. Uh, it's been awesome. But um, we're going to bring the Dolphins, Mount Rushmore, to a close. If you want to hang on one second, we'll end the episode, and we'll just talk for a minute out, off air here. So uh, yeah, that's right. going to – that's going to bring episode 53 of the Dolphins Mount Rushmore with Daisy at Twin Z Trouble to a close. Skull Brothers out. <laughs>